Hi folks, this is Ken Behrens with Tropical Birding, and today I'll take you on a virtual birding tour of Bhutan. This is the overall geographical context of Bhutan. It's part of the Indian subcontinent. Here's India, and here's China and the Tibetan Plateau. So it's basically this little country sandwiched between the plains of India and the mountains on either side and the Tibetan Plateau up above. It's in the Eastern Himalayas, which are the richest part of the Himalayas for birds and wildlife in general. They get more moisture than the Central and Western Himalayas, and a lot of the coolest Asian birds are found in this part of the range. So I'll be showing you some of those. Zooming in a bit, you can really see Bhutan stops at the plains and at the Tibetan Plateau. It's an entirely mountainous country. There's hardly a flat place to be found. Here's a 3D view of the western part of Bhutan where our tour visits. And you can just see it's a uh, big ridge line and valley, big ridge, valley. That's pretty much what this tour is. It's climbing up to a pass and then going down into a valley, and a pass and a valley. We sometimes call this trip birding in Shangri-La. Um, Shangri-La is this idea of a paradisical Buddhist kingdom hidden in the mountains. And it was from a book and a movie in the 1930s called Lost Horizon. And Bhutan isn't quite that, but it's the closest thing you'll find in reality. It's this kind of magical little kingdom tucked up in the mountains, almost forgotten by the modern world, and with endless pristine forest. It's incredibly culturally rich. There's prayer flags everywhere. Buddhist monasteries full of red rope monks. And one of the things that I really love about Bhutan is that almost everything in the country is beautiful. Even the houses of ordinary people, they take an incredible amount of care in artistry in building their homes. So this is just an ordinary rural house. Here's another one. This is not some kind of tourist attraction. This is just an ordinary house. And here's a normal little shop like you'd find anywhere in the world. <laughs> you might have your fake knockoff Winnie the Pooh bags and some kind of ugly water jugs, but basically this is authentically Bhutanese. There's a traditional dress and almost everybody wears it almost all the time. So that adds something picturesque to Bhutan as well. Bhutan is a kingdom, and this is the young king and queen of Bhutan. You see their pictures all over the place. They're really revered by the people. And this king's father, whose picture is here, was famous for saying that in Bhutan we worry about the gross national happiness, not the gross national product. Not only is Bhutan incredibly rich culturally, it's incredibly rich biologically. There's just endless, rich, pristine forest. Something around 90% of the country is still forested. It's just, even along the main highway, there's just beautiful forest everywhere, endless bird habitat, wildlife habitat. This is the tropical birding tour route. This takes in Western Bhutan. We used to do a longer trip that went all the way through Bhutan from the east to the west. And we now do a shorter Western Bhutan trip that takes in really the best of Bhutan and a shorter trip. And another good thing about this trip is that it's entirely in hotels, whereas the longer trip traditionally involved a lot of nights of camping, which was something a lot of folks didn't want to do. So you can see there's one main road through Bhutan, and we follow about half of that main road, and we do a lot of our birding along that highway. There's not a lot of traffic, and there's lots of wonderful forest. So the tour starts in the city of Paro. You can see this is the Paro Valley, and here's the airport. And the approach to this airport is one of the most hair-raising you will ever fly. There's only a handful of pilots who are certified to fly this route. 
because it basically involves brushing one hillside and then brushing another hillside and brushing another hillside and then dropping down into this valley. It's pretty exciting. But once you're in Paro, <clears throat> we stay at a hotel that's here on the slopes of the mountain and it's surrounded by a beautiful forest. And we start our birding right around the hotel with some great birds like Rufus Fronted Tit and Crimson Browed Finch and White Browed Scimitar Babbler. Down in the Paro Valley along the river, we will look for Ibis Bill. Really cool, big shorebird that makes up its own family of birds. Always a big target for family listers. So after sleeping in Paro, we wake up very early and we drive up this road that you can see here that winds all the way up to this pass called Chelela. Chelela is at about 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet. Uh, so it's actually the highest place we visit on the tour. And one of our big targets at Chelela is the Himalayan monal. This is sort of what it feels like to see a monal in the distance through the trees. And then sometimes we can get pretty close to them. Spectacular birds, members of the pheasant family. Lots of other great high elevation birds up there like spotted nutcracker, several different laughing thrushes like black face laughing thrush. And my personal favorite, one of my favorite Himalayan birds is spotted laughing thrush. Big, loud, beautiful, intricately marked laughing thrush. We might see the cute little large-eared pika. Up in the conifer trees, there's a couple different species of grosbeaks, including the white-winged grosbeak. And another major target is the great-looking and kind of unusually colored blood pheasant. It's a high-elevation bird. Back down in the Paro Valley, we visit the Paro Zong. Zongs are some of the most culturally and archeologically interesting things in Bhutan. They're sort of combination monastery, castle, and town hall. They had all these combined functions historically in Bhutan. Very impressive sort of medieval looking structures. One of the cool things about these Zongs is that they are still actively used by the government. So they're not just historical buildings, they're actually living buildings. This is a procession that was part of the annual festival at the Paro Zong. One remarkable thing about Bhutan <clears throat> is that it has some of the world's friendliest and best looking dogs that always seem to be immaculately groomed. They seem like stray dogs, but they are the world's happiest stray dogs. You just see friendly, perfectly groomed pooches everywhere. They look like they just came straight from the pet spa, basically. From Paro, we drive about an hour, hour and a half east to the national capital of Timpu. This is the biggest, most modern city in Bhutan. It's famous in the Buddhist world for having one of the largest Buddha statues in the world. Timpu is also famous as allegedly the only capital city in the world that doesn't have a single street light. So this is the big roundabout at the center of Timpu. And uh, there's an immaculately dressed policeman there who directs the traffic. There's no traffic lights. Timpu is also the place that is changing the fastest and modernizing the fastest. Uh, Bhutan is syncing up with the modern world and the good and the bad things that come with that. 
In the Timpu Valley, we visit some wetlands where we hope to find the scarce black-tailed creek. And after spending the night in the capital, we do a day trip up this valley called the Cherry Valley. It's a beautiful valley with lots of great forest. We're looking for birds like Brown Dipper. It's a good stakeout for Yellow Rumped Honey Guide. Yellow-billed blue magpie. And there's a beautiful monastery perched on the side of this mountain, the Cherry Monastery. Well, after sleeping in Timpu, we head up to another pass, the Dochula. We head up this valley, and you can see that here's the high point, which is Dochula. There's lots of great forest. And this is an excellent area for Himalayan flock birding. This is some of my favorite birding in the world. You can get 20, 30, 40 species of birds in one flock, and they're just some fabulously good looking birds. This is a bar tailed Minla, blue fronted redstart, black throated tit, gray crested tit. You get a lot of tits in these mixed flocks. Green backed tit. White browed fulvetta often join in. And you'll get other things like rufous bellied woodpecker. Really good looking, sort of sapsucker like woodpecker. And Darjeeling woodpecker. It's a fairly ordinary looking woodpecker, but with a cool name like Darjeeling woodpecker, who wouldn't want to see this? So yeah, you can see all of those birds in one flock if you're lucky. Uh, it's just very exciting, dynamic birding. You can even get things like green-tailed sunbird mixed in. And there tend to be a lot of flowers at uh, Dochu La. These are rhododendrons. These are magnolias. And some of these magnolias are not like the other magnolias. <laughs> these are actually uh, Himalayan langurs eating magnolia blossoms. So from Dochula, we continue east towards the Fujika Valley. There's some high points on the road along the way where we often see snow pigeon, usually in these big wheeling flocks. Occasionally you'll get them on the ground. And after a fairly long drive, we arrive here on the main road and then we drop down into the Fujika Valley. We spend one night there. It's quite a high, dry, cold valley. And we wake up early the next morning to go birding at another pass called Pelela. And from Pelela, you have a great view of the main Himalayan range, a bunch of peaks over 20,000 feet tall. And one of the big targets here at Pelela is the satyr tragopan. It's definitely one of the best birds in the world. You can hardly believe this bird actually exists. And if you're really lucky, like my friend Charlie Hess, also a guide for tropical birding, you might see a satyr tragopan displaying. You have this big inflatable sack that's pink and blue, which you'll see in a second. Also have these blue horns on the head that come up when they display. <clears throat> Pelela is also a good place for the huge Himalayan griffin, a massive vulture. And when there are lots of blooming rhododendrons like these, it's a good place for the fire-tailed Mysornis. Really cool little bird, nectar eating specialist. I love these little white tips to the uh, wing feathers. From Pelela, we head east again on the main highway, heading for Trongsa. 
Trangsa is pretty much the central point of Bhutan. Along the way, we'll have a typical Bhutanese lunch. Um, Bhutanese food is quite nice. What they give to uh, foreigners is usually pretty bland, not real spicy, but it's sort of like Indian food, but spiced down. Eat lots of rice, lots of nice fresh vegetables. And actually one of the staples of Bhutan is chili peppers. Um, Bhutanese eat a lot of chili peppers. So the national dish of Bhutan is something called hemadasi, which is a mix of cheese and chili. It's really spicy, but really good. I love it. So here's Trongsa, right in the middle of Bhutan. Trongsa is perched up on the side of this mountain with this spectacular valley below, and it's the site of a zong. And this is actually my favorite Bhutanese zong. It's not nearly as famous as some, and it's smaller, but I just find it architecturally spectacular. There's a view of the valley below. These zongs are almost like an Escher drawing. From Trongsa, we leave the one main national highway and we head south on this side road that goes down to India. On our way out of town, we bird some forest. That is a good place for Ward's Trogan. It's a real special bird of the eastern Himalayas. This is a female ward strogan. Really big trogan. It's hard to tell in this movie, but it's a great big chunky trogan. So we head down this big valley. Um, here you're at around 8,000 feet in Trongsa, and you head all the way down to around 700 feet. So it's a huge loss in elevation, and you enter some very different forest with a whole different set of birds. This is actually probably the best birding of the trip, and we spend three nights down here in the village of Shemgang. This is the village, it has a great view. Lots of forest. And there's a side road where we do most of our birding. It's uh, quite peaceful, not a lot of traffic, and tons of birds. One of the big targets is the rufous-necked hornbill. This is another eastern Himalayan specialty. A huge, spectacular hornbill. Bhutan is the best place in the world to see this bird. Lots of laughing thrushes, like the red-faced leocicla, and the silver-eared mesia, which is also a laughing thrush. Vertiter flycatcher, I always describe it as a uh, sky blue wood pewee. Pretty much acts like a pewee. Rusty-cheeked scimitar babbler. And you get a lot of flocks here, big mixed flocks of birds with things like red-tailed minla, and rusty fronted bar wings, pretty common. And this is a prize, the Himalayan cutia. It's sort of like a giant nuthatch, but it's actually in the laughing thrush family. And sometimes mixed with flocks of cutias, you get one of the most sought after birds in all of Asia, one of the rarest and hardest to find birds, which is the beautiful nuthatch extremely scarce localized bird that's really only found in pristine forest. Sometimes you get colored owlets, little diurnal owlet. And there's a few mammals around Shemgang as well. This is the uh, Himalayan black giant squirrel. You can't really tell in this photo, but this thing is absolutely massive. It's about three feet or one meter long. It's like an otter just climbing around in the trees. And there's this wonderful endangered monkey, the golden langur as well. 
very localized range in a little bit of Bhutan and India. We spend a lot of our time here around the village of Shemgang, but on at least one day, we also drop way down to Tingtibi. Tingtibi is a little village at lower elevation. This is what it looks like. It's starting to get quite low and steamy and warm, and you can feel that the plains of India are not too far away. We often stop at a little shop for a cup of tea. <laughs> it gives you a feeling for what a small town shop looks like. One of the reasons that we drop down to Tingtibi is to get into some good bamboo habitat because bamboo has some specialist birds like the pale-billed parrotbill. It's good for birds like sultan tit as well. And you get another spectacular hornbill at these lower elevations, the great hornbill. So from Shemgang, we start to retrace our route back to Paro. Along the way, or at some point along this trip, we hope to lock into one of the coolest things you can see in Bhutan, which is an archery competition. The archery is actually the national sport of Bhutan. People are very passionate about it. So here you can see is a guy shooting. <laughs> Remarkably long shot. And here you can see the other end. These guys stand right next to the target as the arrow is inbound. It's terrifying. They wait to just the last minute to move out of the way. <laughs> Amazing. So after a long day's drive, we make our way to Punaka. Punaka has what's usually regarded as the most beautiful zong in Bhutan. It's right next to a river and it's quite a huge structure. Very elaborate. Beautiful setting as well. And of course there's beautiful friendly dogs that look like they just came from the pet spa. We spend two nights in Punaka, and we make a full day's trip up into this valley, into some more pristine forest, part of the Jigmit Dorje National Park. By this point, we've probably seen most of the possible birds, but we're still looking for things like white-throated laughing thrush, mountain hawk eagle, and it's one last chance for this very special bird. It might look like a little brown job, but it actually makes up its own family. It's called the spotted elachura. It used to be considered a wren babbler, but it's just so different that it's in its own family now. And it's a very skulky bird. As you can see from this photo, you never see it in the open. Another day's drive brings us from Punaka back to Paro, where our tour began. And in Paro, we have one last mission. We visit the most famous cultural site in Bhutan, which is the Tiger's Nest Monastery. So this is the Paro Valley, and way up on the side of this cliff is the Tiger's Nest Monastery. It's a decent hike up the mountain to get there. Lots of good birding along the way. You start to see the monastery just perched on this cliff. Get closer and closer. And then you get right next to the monastery. Absolutely spectacular place. One of the most spectacular human structures I've ever seen. I don't know how they built this monastery into the side of a cliff. So that wraps up the main Bhutan tour. We also do an extension in the plains of Assam. So we fly out of Paro, a short flight down to the big city of Guwahati. You see this is the Brahmaputra River and there's a big plain, and the Kaziranga National Park protects a big patch of forest and grassland next to the Brahmaputra. It's a very different kind of birding and wildlife viewing than in Bhutan. It's flat, and you drive around in jeeps. There's some nice 
lowland forest. But the main attraction is big open plains and wetlands. And this is probably the best place outside of Africa for seeing lots of big mammals in one area. So here you have uh, swamp deer, Asian elephant, and that's a rhino in the background. Here's a bunch of Asian water buffalo, some cattle egrets, and an Asian elephant. And the real star at Kaziranga is the Indian rhino, or the one-horned rhino. It's getting to be a very, very rare animal globally. It's still wonderfully common in this national park. I've actually seen 70 from one single spot in Kaziranga, just sitting at a tower and counting. You, you can see one in action. These guys just look so prehistoric, even more so than the African rhinos to me. They look like some kind of medieval knight covered in armor. If a dinosaur just walked out of that forest, you almost wouldn't be surprised. It just seems like an animal of another age. Of course, there's a lot of birds too. The lowlands are pretty diverse. You can see a hundred birds in a day in Kaziranga. You get things like bronze-winged jacana and some grassland birds like chestnut-capped babbler. And this is the college pheasant. Well, that wraps up our tour. For folks who are thinking about visiting Bhutan, I'll tell you a little bit more about this tour. So this used to be a fairly rugged tour in which camping was required, but we now do this Western and Central Bhutan tour entirely staying in hotels, and most of them are pretty nice. This is actually a hotel where we stay on the tour. It's such a beautiful place that it actually looks like some kind of archeological monument. This is just our hotel. Very, very comfortable place. It actually has heated floors, which is a bit over the top. Quite nice though. This is a typical kind of hotel where we stay along the way. Uh, very comfortable. Only real considerations for people might be the high altitude, up to 13,000 feet on one day, but it's become quite an easy tour. This is a tour that really appeals to almost anybody. You have beautiful scenery, beautiful forest, easy birding, and lots of interesting cultural stuff. Um, there's really no part of Bhutan that isn't culturally interesting. So this isn't just a tour for hardcore birders. It's something that really just about anybody will enjoy. Birding in Shangri-La.